they'll, they'll be. Are you making quite a few changes to the property then? Yeah, there's a lot of before stuff you, before you move in. Yeah, there's stuff like a lot of the walls are being knocked down inside the house because it's quite um, nice because that really changed. It's, it's yours at that point. Yeah, um, it, it's quite a flat house, right? So it doesn't need much support. Like there's no like mm. heavy roof to to look after. So they said, yeah, they can take out most of the walls in there. Like they don't know why, <laughs> why they're there in the first place. So <laughs> yeah, we're knocking them out. Um, for, for storage space, I mean, that's the big one. If you have fewer walls. So when we moved into this place, we were told, and obviously I would need an architect to confirm, but we were told that the, um, all of the walls, there's RSJs across, and all of the walls in the main house are just fake walls. Yeah. They're just plasterboard. I was like, hmm, that sounds too good to be true. Because once the kids have moved out, you know, in like 10 years or, or more, um, <laughs> we could just knock through and I could have like my grand piano room <laughs> nice. <laughs> I I don't like the look of a proper grand piano, but I love uh, Yamaha do an amazing mini grand. But yeah. you also need to put it in the right size room. We've got a room that it would fit in, but you would just deafen yourself trying to play it in there. Yeah, I love it. Uh, I love I love the look of like big old pianos. I think oh, they're, they're timeless. One of my um, grandparents has one in their house as well, and I always wanted to play on it as a kid. But yeah, it's classy. Um, yeah, but yeah, th well, that's my, that's one of my goals. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one to have. Um, there's lots of changes. Like there's all sorts of garden structural changes and like a new. There, there's a pool there as well, but it's kind of in like, oh. yeah, it's kind of in. A, it's, you know, like how conservatories are made out of that plastic type of, you know. I see. In a in sort of like a temporary structure rather than yeah a, yeah um, yeah yeah and it's it's yeah. all, it's all like white plastic and kind of see for in a bit Ugh. so we're actually going to try and build like a, a proper pool house around it so yeah. I mean if you swim and that's something you do regularly it's definitely worth the investment mm. uh, but it, it, I know from not experience personally but friends experience that running a pool whether whether it's indoor or out is is not cheap yeah so it's. it's it's the last it's like it's the last thing on the list we're like okay well everything always goes over over budget you know with house renovations yeah. like like that's we know that but it's like well, prices so... prices at the moment when we were doing this room the price of wood when we contacted the traders were like are, are you buy they were like are you buying this month because the quote we can give you is valid for 15 days next month we anticipate it being like 150 200 percent on top of that yeah yeah, 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 we're buying the wood. <laughs> ah. Give us, give us. Yeah, that's how okay. it is. Hi, Kev. Hey, Kev. I don't have video today. That's all right. I can't, I can't find the laptop. I don't know. I don't know where it is. Just a, one of the kids snap it. I don't know. <laughs> all right, uh, you, you're a tiny bit quiet. I've got you on two hundred, but it should be all right. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, oh, that's I, hold on. Oh, that's yeah. Much better, yeah. Give yeah, us that soothing that's, Kev that's... ASMR voice. No. My ASMR. <laughs> uh, yes. Oh, I can see your screen, Michael. Oh yeah. Oh look at that. A window into Michael's world. <laughs> this is my world. It's you guys. <laughs> Yay. Oh nice. Yay. Yeah, we were just talking about house stuff, Kev. Um, you know, the renovations and all of that and prices. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't have that. I don't have that issue. I'm yeah. Yeah. So relatively, it's... relative apartment. I'd I'd love to I'd love to get a bigger bigger place, but I uh L A. I don't know, man. I mean, maybe freezing all these assets now, um, you know, might might crash real estate. No, no, no. That that'll never happen. Yeah. But uh, that would be nice. <laughs> they'll find a way <laughs> to uh to keep I, it I, crap. I don't know how um accurate it is, but since. Since the feeling I have is that uh, most of the UK property market and the UK bank's assets are linked to that property market, there's kind of this uh, feedback loop that al almost ensures the housing market can't go down because if that goes down, then a lot of you yeah. know investments also go with it. I, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm not a conspiracy guy at all, but I do, I do, um, I do ascribe to the, you know, inflate assets at all costs to keep the wealthy wealthy. So they're going to move, you know, the people who pull the levers are going to be moving to protect their own assets. It's just human nature. So you're right. I mean, I, I, I think that I don't, I don't, I would have hoped real estate would have come in line with, you know, 
normal wages and and income uh and mm. uh in the last 20 years it's just completely decoupled oh so. yeah 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 uh, it would take wages to grow significantly i was watching a um a youtube thing dare it be um <laughs> the other day uh, about how wage real real wages haven't really gone up in like 10 years mm. but More. everything else has gone up and i, I sat yep. there and i thought for a moment i was like have it oh wait a minute things like uh, the, the the typical menial jobs that you know the basic admin or janitor roles you know the the people that actually prop up a lot of companies keeping them going and or ba uh, I've said basic admin but they're like advertised between like nine and twelve pounds an hour and I remember going back and this is going back some this is when I was still um, at school sort of college level so between sixteen and eighteen I had a nighttime job so it was nights at a yep. uh, sizable nuclear power station, but it was in the canteen. Hmm. So I basically worked five to seven hours, starting at like 11 all the way through to four or five in the morning. But I was on 13 quid an hour. And we're going back like 20 years. I'm like, this, you know, when when people are getting paid 10 pounds, nine pounds, seven pounds, I don't know what the minimum wage in the UK is at the moment. I think it's seven pound 80 something. Um, mm. that was rather precise for also not knowing, mm. but it's, it's just like, what? Yeah. <clears throat> it, it always, um, depresses me when like, yeah, you look back at, oh, oh speaking to family members are like, oh yeah, you know, we bought this house for like, like X, like a four digit number. And I'm like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> like really? I know. I, my parents, <sighs> my parents bought their place for like, I think it was like. Sixty thousand dollars or seventy thousand dollars back in like nineteen eighty. Yeah, and and that's a, it's not even a, a large house, but it's probably like I think it's like four hundred or five hundred thousand dollars now. Wow. It's it's just sad because if I went back in time, I could probably get my own place, you know. And now I really can't. I mean, and I'm I'm very lucky. Like I can't complain because I'm you know I'm in a good family. I'm still living with my parents. It's fine. I have mm. I pay some rent. It's not much because yeah. my parents don't want to extort like me and my brother out of our earnings because they know how hard it is. Mm. Um, yeah, you're in a totally different place than we were. Yeah, absolutely. It's it is strange. It is really, really odd. And we've reached this this particular sort of crossroads a few years back, but now we're in a position where um, if I was to be renting this house rather than actually buying it through a mortgage, we'd be spending nearly double what it is on rent than it is a mortgage and i'm like well that makes no sense because you you also banks won't accept that as a proof that you can afford a mortgage it's like guys if i had a more i'll be able to pay it off in half the time sort of thing oh i know it's yeah. it's it's so you, you own right you're through a mortgage so yeah i mean but yeah this relatively so you're paying off a loan yeah it's I, I had I, I had a I had a four bedroom house in Iowa that we we sold for like thirty three thousand dollars, and uh, it, it needed some work, but I couldn't believe that like Iowa, you know, and, and you come to L.A. in that same house. If I took that house and I dropped it on the ground anywhere in Los Angeles, it would be like eight hundred thousand dollars. Wow, that's, I mean, those sorts of things happen in the U.K. as well, just a few miles apart. So I used to live in a village called Cockgrave in the UK. It's near Nottingham. All right. And if we had picked up, I think the house was about 130,000 when we bought it. And if I picked it up and moved it three miles north to Radcliffe or three miles west towards um, Keyworth, mm -hmm. so the, the price would have been 50 grand more. Yeah. And it makes no sense because Cockgrave <clears throat> had the same infrastructure, it had the same sort of school systems and everything else. There was no fundamental difference other than it being an old, what we call in the UK, a pit village or a colliery. It used to be a mining village 40, 50 years ago. I mean, <laughs> the stigma yeah. stays. I'll have my bargain of the house. And welcome to Blenderness, by the way. Yeah. Welcome to Blenderness. <laughs> Where, Where we, we talk about housing. Well, we could actually... We could actually um, move the conversation taking wages and there was uh mm -hmm. henning henning had posted uh or flip normals had posted um yeah he'd posted on twitter a wage survey or something from um let me see if i can find it. aha yes a wage survey uh that 
for the UK, um, average salary for visual effects workers in the UK, junior starting at minimum 31,000 pounds, mid 46,000 pounds, and senior 73,000 pounds. Those are minimums. Average is 33 for junior, 50 for mid, and 82 for senior. Right. And, uh, and, and I'm thinking like, even at, at a, you know, if you, you translate that to dollars, it's like 1.33 yeah. right now. Right. You, you, you can't live well in London on those, on that, <laughs> unless you're shacking up with, you know, five or six roommates or whatever, like, and eating ramen noodles all night long. Like I, that's not even, even if they pay, even if you have free healthcare there, right. I still, that's, that doesn't seem, that seems really low. You got to remember taxes and everything come off from that. And if you've been to university, your student loan will be taken out of that mm. as well. Mm. So th those sorts of things, very, you know, it sounds like a good wage initially. Um, I know, I know from experience, from a, a not personally, but through another friend who's um, just started a job and they're on about forty thousand, which is a, a quite a respectable wage. But once you've taken off all that they're earning, they're actually down, including taxes, national insurance and all that lot. Not to mention if you're, you know, paying a pension and all the other things that go along with it. But they're down to about 28. Yeah. So it's amazing well, how a, a big number becomes a very small one very rapidly. Oh, well, see, I'm going from the opposite side of that. I'm looking at those numbers going, that's really low. Like, I'm, I'm looking at that going, some, people are, Britain, some, people are getting, some people are getting really, <laughs> really ripped off. Yep. <clears throat> because because what they're charging what they're charging what those companies are charging per foot or per whatever the however they they have it structured to charge mm. um what they're charging you know per minute or whatever is way above that even amortized over the cost of a number of heads that is still like i mean you've got to remember we live in a a global market as well and prices will often be just on where you live and, and nothing else. And of course, if you outsource to a country that has a lower cost of living, then you'll often get maybe the same quality of work for a lot less. So you, I can purely see from a business standpoint why you would outsource to um, countries with a lower cost of living. Yeah, mm. and, 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 that, and that would hold true if it weren't the UK, which in London has an insanely high cost of living. It is it not, does, this, yeah. London's yeah. not a cheap city. <laughs> It's oh, like yeah. it's on par with Whoa. other world cities. I mean, it's definitely, I would say, probably on par with New York City, if I had to guess, at e least, you know. Eating out is risky <laughs> in London if you don't have the funds. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, thank God for McDonald's. Because they like, if you had like a heat, like a heat map of the the cost of food, like it it dips, like just where McDonald's appears. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're, they're really wow. doing a good service. Um, but yeah. but yeah, no, it's difficult. I um, I got a message from a follower yesterday or the day before. Actually, no, it's probably earlier than that. I've been really bad with responding, so it's probably a lot earlier. But um, they 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 said to me um, they're new to three D art, they're learning, they're they want to learn how to make money with it, but NFTs are the only thing that's been giving them like anything so far. Is is there a way to pivot out of it? And I was like, oh, that's actually a really, really difficult question to answer. So I said really to them, hard. yeah, I said, look, I I don't give personal like financial advice to people, but I will give you a few rants. Yeah. So I just, you know, just said some things I believe about, you know, it's it is difficult to make money early on like if you've got like a kind of low skill level but there are ways you can try and monetize it and the the best advice i gave was look if you're still in your, your learning process whatever you make any pieces of artwork any resources you make give them away for free to start with if you want you know kind of the same technique that a lot of us are doing with youtube just to build up a bit of a following you know yep. and there's always a possibility that some people will give you donations and stuff because realistically charging for stuff that early on it probably won't go anywhere but if you just open up that possibility, that's a good thing to do. But going back to the whole, um, like the cost of living thing, I I look at myself and I think I'm completely hopeless with like budgeting and stuff. Um, I have no idea like how much I make any month. I only really figure out how much I've made on a year when like April comes around, you know, <laughs> and um, mm -hmm. have to do all the tax stuff. I don't use credit cards. I don't have like a good credit score as far as I'm concerned. I've got one credit card. It's a mess. Like whenever I use it, I set up the direct debit so it should pay out automatically. And whenever it comes around to the time of the month, it fails. And I have no idea why. 
because the, huh. my debit still works so i have to go in, in and do it manually i'm like okay i have to force myself to remember because i have to force myself to remember i don't want to use it anymore and then like yeah. it never tells you exactly like what the the right amount to pay is like well at least for the people that i'm using they give you like three options and a fourth one for entering a custom amount they're like choose what you want to pay i'm like no you're supposed to tell me what i owe <laughs> i'd like to pay off the amount so i don't get any of <laughs> yeah yeah it's like it tries to be ambiguous like and it, it does. I, I hate it i hate it i hate the credit system and it, like yeah, american express has the same every bill i have to actually go through and i have to be like all right when was the closing date when was you know what is this what it's like i'm just like give me what i owe i don't want any runaround yeah but they, they try to do it so it's like oh well you could do this and this and this and we'll just charge you this and this and it's like no 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 no. <laughs> yeah. no, 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 no when when we moved house uh, obviously when you're moving house whether it's rental or actual buying you've got more expenses than you would usually do. You've got the moving, you've got decorating and all the rest of it. And we got into this position where I was paying off the credit card multiple times in a month. So I phoned them up and said, look, can I have a credit? Can, can you raise my credit limit? Because this is ridiculous. I'm paying this off three or four times and I'd paid it off so many times in one particular month that they wouldn't accept any more payments off. Mm. And I, they were like, no. I was like... No. I mean, it's a bit like that rental scenario earlier where I'm kind of proving I can pay off. And and it <laughs> I I learned that if you actually overpay your so with my particular lender, if you paid off uh, say you had a two thousand limit and you paid just and it was zero and you paid two thousand, you've now got a four thousand limit. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So I just used that to my advantage. I was just like, okay, I think I'm gonna spend like five grand this month. Okay, I'll just dump the money in. Then I can use the credit card because, of course, credit card gives you the extra assurances uh, that you get with using uh, or buying things on credit. So it's true. They're, they're, credit cards are not evil, evil. They're, they're I mean, they're they're a means. They're get, a tool. They're a tool, just like everything else. You know, yeah. it's how it's it's how you use it. But there are a lot of people who are suffering under massive loads of credit card debt because they have to use credit card debt just to make ends meet, and it's like. You know what I? I'm honestly, those wages I saw were shocking. I mean, this is mm. this is London, and I'm like, you know, I mean, well, it includes London, so it it's sad. It all it takes wow. is a few a few bits of genuine bad luck. You know, your boiler breaks, that can be two grand. That's your month's wage gone, and yeah. then your car's clutch fails, or or something along those lines. Yep. That's another two grand. So you take it out on credit card. And then yep. something else happens, like the the fuel prices are now going up everywhere. Those sort of things are completely out of your control. And uh, yep. you know, I've had people say, "Oh, well, you should have built up a big nest egg." Okay, person that comes from extremely privileged background, yes. that's fine. Mm. Exactly. You Thank sit you, on trust, your nest egg. Trust, trust fund brat. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Ah. Uh. Uh, yeah, um, I'm I'm with you there, Curtis. When you're in a sort of a freelance role. Uh, which I suppose we could call ourselves that. If you work for yourself, you're freelance. And you, even if you're doing your own YouTube channel or anything like that, you are pretty much making it for you and hoping for the best afterwards. I can have, um, in the in the sort of instructor role, I can literally have, uh, for example, a £1,000 one month and then mm. 2000 the next, then 400 And yeah. then... It, it, it literally goes all over the place. So being able to financially plan, you, you you like hope you get median of all of that over time, but it can it can be all over the place. And I think that's something you have to be comfortable with if you go into anything, anything freelance, working for yourself. You're gonna have those times where money isn't coming in, and that's where you hustle. That's where you start either advertising yourself, you knuckle down making assets uh, i mean that might not be the best thing or making youtube videos or you know insert what it is that you're good at in that place and make people aware of what you're doing don't sit there for four months in complete cocooned and silence mm. because no one will know what you're doing you've disappeared yeah there's a that's, that's a hard thing during during the hustle it, it's very um easy to self-sabotage yourself even when yeah. you're, you're aware of that problem because uh like recently from my experience i you know i've had a big break from putting out products i think i put out modular metals at the end of 2020 and then didn't do a lot for like all of 2021 I think wow I put, was, tw I, was that when modular metals yeah that end of like yesterday yeah exactly <laughs> um 
But I, I mean, I did release some, like a, a little bit of stuff, but then everything kind of yeah. kicked off at the end of 2021 with Biogen and now recently the new content pack update. So my plan for this year was to do more products. And mm. um, that has been working out so far because with, when putting out the Generators Lab content pack for Biogen, I'd like I put in this server. It was like, it was the biggest payday for Gumroad so far, which is, you know, impressive. But getting it out was actually a real struggle because because it had been a while since I'd done something that valuable. I, I was sitting here for days thinking, okay, I need to prioritize like the final tasks. And I had like a list of all the things I wanted to do. And it just got to a point where I was like, no, I can't do all of them. So wow. like just start crossing off things that I don't need. Mm -hmm. And then it was also kind of good, maybe like a weird twist of fate thing where I was doing an expert panel thing for like an eyewear company trying to get into gaming my uncle has a market research company so i was doing it for them on like the day that i wanted to put out the the pack or like the, the day after or something so i was like oh god i need to do it like beforehand in my mind i was thinking that because if i don't do it then it's gonna like drag on for ages so i had like this really intense rush and like you know I think that pressure kind of helped me to knock things off and just like actually assess it and go, okay, no, realistically, if you want to get this out now, you're going to have to cut back on stuff. Um, yeah. But like, I, I know a lot about, you know, self-sabotage. I've been doing it to myself for like over a decade, but oh, e yeah. even just knowing about it, it, when you take those breaks and come back to it, you're like, oh yeah, like I forgot what it felt like, you know? Yeah. You guys are our content, your, your content producers and business owners. It's a, it's a bit different. So it's, you know, you're right. I mean, the money comes and goes and comes and goes and it's a waves. Mm, and uh, it's yeah. not like being on a salary where you're steady and you can plan. And that's why, you know, banks are, are reluctant to give you a mortgage if, you know, they don't see a, a, a series of payments, you know, going going back over time. It's uh, it's it's a catch-22 because on, on, on one hand, you could do a lot better than you can ever with a salary because you don't have anything capping you. You don't have HR saying you can only make this much an hour and this is your wage and this is your title. Like you have your own thing, right? So you can, I mean, the sky's the mm -hmm. limit as far as, you know, you, but you have to hustle mm. and uh, it's a different, it's a different life. The, you the know? Thing, and, and I'm straddling, I'm straddling both sides and it's like, yeah. I just, it's, it burns you out. The, the thing I've had a problem with is, I, I always tell myself I just want to make enough to survive, but I have no idea how much that is, or what that's supposed yeah. to be. It's exactly it's what a mo saying. it's a moving target, Curtis. Yeah, it really is. So I I would keep giving myself numbers like okay, make a hundred dollars a day, and we're okay. And like I don't I don't know if I hit that every day. Like I think I do. And then and then like the target changes like okay make a couple of thousand dollars a month. I work in dollars because everything's on dollars. Okay, if I can do that then. I think I'm all right. And um, like, I, okay, a bit of secret insight to blend less viewers. Um, I think I'm kind of around, I'm around like somewhere between, in, I'm not going to give a specific number, but in between 20 to 40,000 pounds is my kind of like salary as, like, mm -hmm. as running this. And I know I could like double that if I did, you know, very specific types of work, but I... I knock off so many projects just because I know the stress of doing it is like more than I would want to do. Or like, you know, there's very specific types of content, even for YouTube that, you know, would have like, would give you more money, but I can't force myself to do something if I don't feel like it. That's one of the reasons why like I'm doing this type of job in the first place. I don't want to work for anyone. It might sound mm -hmm. quite immature, but you know, it's like my it's, mind just like cringes. Like it's, it's not immature. It's common. Yeah. <laughs> I think I can empathize with that. There's a thing in the courses space where you you mark up your courses to two, three, four hundred dollars, and then you say oh, it's a common thing with Udemy anyway. To, mm. Oh, they're on sale today for only twenty dollars, only twelve dollars. Yeah. Um, I specifically don't do that. I I and I I would probably get more sales if I portrayed it as worth hundreds of dollars and you're getting an absolute bargain today. But I consider that so dishonest. Yeah. Because it's, false, it's always it's on sale. Yeah. You know, if it, if it was a once a year thing. If it was once a year you could get things for ten dollars. Hey, it's my birthday, guys. You know, today we're gonna have a treat for today only, that sort of thing. Yeah. If you, if you miss out then but it's the same as Steam sales. I will now wait until a Steam sale comes around before I buy any game because it's going to be a lot cheaper than it was what seems like only a couple of weeks ago. 
Yeah, uh, but I, I find the whole yeah. thing of barking it up and then and then and then bringing it down so low. Just sell the courses at that amount so everybody's got access. I mean, I, I my thoughts on education is it should be as free as possible or as accessible and available as possible. But I do think creators need to get paid. I mean, ultimately, yeah. if if there was a grant that I could apply from the UK government to provide education for free to the U UK and the rest of the world, that'd be amazing. Yeah, you have to but live. There, but there's not, and yeah. someone has to fill up my wine glass. <laughs> right, you need the wine. Yeah, that's it's, true. It is. It's true. It's you know, it's when when the, when the the rare comments come in, like you know, you know, you're you're so greedy. Why don't you post post the you know? Yeah. Can you post the 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 file for us? I'm like. I do it for my patrons. Like, uh, you probably do it for, for a it. dollar. Yeah, you know, or something I, like that. And, and my Patreon is cheap; it's like three dollars like, to buy it. It's, sorry yeah. to jump in here, but like, you, you remind me of a comment that pissed me off. And again, like modular metals, and I knew I was going to get something because it's a sixty-dollar product, and I've never done that before, right? And they were like, "Oh, you know, charging sixty dollars." I was like, "Right, you little shit." I, I um I, I put in a list in the comments of all the packages I'd given away for free, and I was like, there has never been anything more than ten dollars except for this one. Like you know, and looking at all of that, I was like, come on, man. If I jump in here and say, didn't you release a free version of Modular Metals as well? There's okay, so there's a if, I, if I'm rolling back through the directory of resources in my mind, there's a yeah. there's a copper there's a there's a gold foil and a simple copper package which was on the patreon but then got moved to the free gum road resources uh, yeah. i don't think i think that's kind of that that w was the free version i don't think there's an actual free sample pack for modular metals mm -hmm. but i know that those two node groups that are in that patreon migrated to gum road package do yeah. have ones which are in the modular metals pack can't believe I, remember I mean, that. to be to be quite honest, um, anybody with half a noodle, and I'm sorry if this offends someone, I deeply am, but if you've got half a noodle and you get the free pack, you can probably take it apart and work on it yourself. I mean, that's that's kind of how I've learned throughout my entire um, YouTube and, and career going back years. I've taken things apart and seen how they work, including my father's VCR player. <laughs> a VCR is an old... DVD. No, a DVD isn't that anyway for the younger audiences out there. But yeah, it's I've taken stuff apart for years and put it together myself and played around with it. Got things that work, got things that don't work. But that's that's kind of part of the fun and how I roll. But yeah, I mean the amount of stuff that you've chucked out there for free is yeah awesome. It's it's a yeah, payback to the community. A lot of way. Yeah, Absolutely. I remember um, trying to explain this to someone that tried to give me advice on how to price things. I got a little bit annoyed with it because they were very persistent. They're like, oh, you should try pricing it lower, another creator which didn't have much experience. And I was like, no, I'm not going to. The reason is because talking about the average of making a certain amount of money, <laughs> um, I needed a higher price product. The reason is because like over time you'll make a certain number of random, or a certain random number of sales. It never really kind of goes above or below a certain number and um like if all your products are kind of low priced then your average is gonna stay low and the idea was that if i made one high price product at least to start with the average would just tick up a bit because occasionally there'd be yeah. people that would buy it and that would knock it up doo -doo 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 -doo, as you go and i call it now punching the ceiling which is mm -hmm. where every time i make a slightly higher price product so generators lab is i think 15 dollars which again isn't like too high but it's again it's another form of punching the ceiling and what i mean by that is you're taking like your highest average and you're just punching it again so that's me making a spike of income when i release the new product so you're punching it so now the average kind of raises slightly with the idea being that if you punch it enough times then the average gets high enough for you to live off um so I, th I think but, what yeah. you've created, though, especially with something like Modular Metals, advertisement for Modular Metals, um, but it is a fantastic pack. And the fact that you do so much in it that saves people so much time, that's where the value, the price tag actually comes from. It's not necessarily what you think it's worth. It's what it's worth to other people because of the time saving it can have. And yeah. if you if you if you work in Blender and you're 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 one of those free people. I've got to have everything for free. I go to textures.com and get my 15 textures a day and all that lot. That's cool. Save up for a couple of days and 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 buy modular metals, buy whatever pack it is that actually aids you in creating things quicker. But I fully appreciate if you are a hobbyist, then you're spending money towards your hobby, which isn't a bad thing. And you might have just bought a 
really expensive graphics card and be a bit, mm. a bit poor for a few months. That sort of thing happens. But when you actually get into the world of these tools can be used commercially as well. Boys, boys, boys. Boys, 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 boys. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once yeah. you get into the commercial realm, literally a pack like that can save an artist a day's worth of faffing around with materials a week. Yeah. And that's... And one thing I haven't been doing, which I know other people have, is doing like the studio licenses and stuff. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not comfortable enough to do that yet. I like, because that's uh, people putting like something up for. Like, that's imposter syndrome right there. Yeah, uh, uh, that, that is 100. Oh, he's <laughs> classic imposter syndrome. Yeah, well, the yeah. thing is, I I don't know if it's I I just I have like one general license for paid stuff, royalty free license, yeah. right? And I, I don't restrict it by like you know the usage like that, you know, or for certain studios or whatever, or you know, or or seats, you know. I just figure, well, just just buy another one if you want someone else to have access to it. You, you don't, don't really want to become the the Adobe of <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Blender Market or Gumroad. And the thing is, they're talking about like you know making enough to live. I think I'm making enough to survive if I was to live on my own. I can't be sure. I'm not confident about that. Again, talking about the prices of living. Um, yeah, it depends where. Yeah. But if I am doing this well, well in quotes, without have being like an Adobe Hitler for licensing, then um, then why do I need to, like, you know, do all that weird studio stuff? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. But basically, one thing I've got this year is I've got, like, a list of different products I want to get out. I want to do another version of the Modular Metals package. Um, I actually started doing work for that at the end of last year, but like it's just, uh, just the mood changes when I don't feel like doing it. It's, I just do something else entirely. Yeah, I find I find that especially with bigger projects, it's sometimes best to shelve them for a month and yep. come back to them with a fresh eye, rather than uh, being a bit tunnel visioned with it all, and then you end up not making a, as best a product as you can. Uh, yeah, I think I need to do it through the lens of making new artwork. I think that'll be the most effective way to do it because that's the purpose of it in the first place, isn't it? Like if I have like the modular metals library on like my left screen and I'm working on a new kind of metallic art piece of some kind, then I can go, okay, yeah, that worked well. Let me just add that to the pack, you know, and just keep doing it that way. I mean, if anything else, it's all you could use your pack as an example as a great way of using previs. Oh, I want to see what this looks like with the copper material. Okay, I want to see what it looks like with the corroded material. And you just chuck those things on there. I do that all the time with just random textures. I want to see what it looks like with like this, like that. And you may not end up using that in the final product, but the fact that you could have iterated through all of those different types of metal, and yeah. corroded metal, etc., uh, weathered, whatever, incredibly quickly, really does make a difference to your workflow because you got to that end point, actually, I want it to look like this. And then you can push on from there. And that, that does make a huge time saving during that initial stage. Yep. Did it does. Do you know one thing is that's quite interesting is out of all the materials in that pack, there's one I use all the time and it's the complex iron one. And I don't know why, but it's the most versatile material like out of all of them. And I love it so much and I use it for everything. I've got my new Ukraine like yep. artwork there. It's like it's the base for like all the body material and everything. I love it. It's like the one, the, it's the material that's probably been appended the most into any blend file I mean. I'm a sucker for copper, copper based materials, I'm there. Yeah. So, <laughs> Mar what it is. Markham, how you been doing? I am cooked. So, I think I might have mentioned this about a week, two weeks ago. Uh, there's a short film festival here in Canberra. Yeah. Where you've got 10 days to make a short film and you've got these 10 specific items and locations around Canberra. Finished it. Um, yeah. So I've been getting, I've been on like three, four hours of sleep per night for the past week. <laughs> and like last night was the first night where I slept seven hours and it was so, <laughs> nice. <laughs> but it's finished. Um, looks amazing. If I don't get in, there will be questions asked. Oh my God. You don't want an angry marker. So, <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. I'll be pretty, pretty emo. Oh, so. man, I haven't had emo in a while. I was an emo. <laughs> <laughs> had had the long fringe and everything. You didn't see me in school. Yeah. I was, yeah. I, was like, proper. I can semi-imagine it. Oh yeah, I, I've 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 grown up. What's the term? No, I haven't had my glow up yet. I feel like that's coming around the thirties. 
I'll be like the most attractive blender guy you've ever seen. <laughs> I haven't had that yet, but I'm I'm and this kind of like um transition. Just gonna mark phase. down the date. Yeah, I'm in this transition state between being an emo and being the the glow up professional, and that's why I still have a fringe going. You know. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I've, had, um, I've got a fringe yeah. going for other reasons, but we'll move on. <laughs> yeah, I'm, my hair's grown out. I'm starting to look like Ron Jeremy. I got to start working out again. Oh. <laughs> that's the only. That's the only. I mean, that's the only person I, I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh my god, it's happening. I can't. I gotta. I gotta start working out. How, how old are um, you again, Kev? Just have it. Oh, yeah. cut my hair. Forty six. Ah, okay. Gosh. 40, oh, the, the joys of things oh to look forward to. And how old are your girls? Uh, I got one, one, uh, one boy. He's eight, and the girl's twelve. Okay. Uh, so yeah, they're uh, yeah. It's it happens fast, man. I swear. I, I still feel. I mean, honestly, I still feel like I'm in my twenties. But I look in the mirror and I'm like, yeah, it's starting to show. Yeah, I still. Yeah. Uh, I, I was gonna say I still feel like a, I'm at this weird pivotal point in my life where I was just about to leave secondary school. And everything's yeah. been the same since then. And uh, there's a song I listened to just ironically. I, f I can't remember. It's it's called High School. And I can't remember what female artist it's by. And it's, uh, it's funny because there's a line in it when she's like, oh, sometimes I feel like this, but then I remember this isn't high school. And I just keep thinking, oh, God, yeah. Because I've been in this room, like, the whole time. Everyone's got off and had kids and, like, had several career changes. And sure, like, I'm quite proud of what I've managed to achieve, but... At the same time, I don't forget if things really changed since then. <laughs> yeah, so, it's, it's it's all a matter of perspective, man. Like I, I've lived in a few different places. My wife's lived all over the place, and uh, and you know, it's every place you live is like another life. Yeah. So she's like, I can't remember, you know, five lives ago, and I'm like, yeah, I, like, I can't remember three, two, two, even two, two ago. Like I, I just. I had this whole life on the East Coast and you know in New York, and I I can barely remember that now because I've been in LA for so long. I'm pretty much a California native now. So, random question: Yeah, when you guys do like the North, East, South, West, how do you guys remember that? North, East, South, West. As in, as in how? Because the way you... the way we were taught at school was never eat soggy wheat bix. <laughs> Um, never eat soggy, never eat eat soggy wheat mix. Yeah, so you're talking about the cardinal points on a on a on a compass yeah. or on a map. Yeah. Oh yeah, northeast, northeast, southwest. I I don't I don't think we ever acronymed it. Yeah, I don't know if we did. I think it was more like it's just going around clockwise. You know, northeast, southwest. You know, it's just. Yeah, I don't know. It's like the planets. My very. Have you muted? Luckily muted. Pluto's. Oh gone. well. Yeah, it was probably for the best. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we had never eat shredded wheat and naughty elephant squirt water. But I was just saying that uh, I, I was too intelligent. I didn't need to learn those silly ones. Yeah. North, sea, north South, East, West. What about le left and right though? Because all, all I, I remember from that, it was just that hand making an L. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That was it. Yes. Well, that's all I needed to know. Just that hand. Loser. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. learned that from a film later on. I was like, why wasn't I taught that? That would have saved so It's so, so much simple. Time. That's the L. You got it. You're done. The way I've been teaching my kids is you read left to right. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. That's not bad. But we, they do do the L one as well. Love it. Oh, I, I, will, I will say, though, for anyone else out there that was like me, I couldn't read a, an analog clock for the longest time. I just, I mean, there was a point in my life again before my brain exploded and I became kind of engaged with the world where i was just like a complete dud at everything and yeah for all that time i couldn't read a clock i just didn't understand it how it works what the, what the hands were how they pointed to things what do you mean it's quarter to, to something what does that mean that there's a number so, it's you know it's pretty difficult growing up in a military family i had the 24 hour clock. oh i love 24 hour age. clocks Man. and so like so what time do you want to meet and it's been like oh that 1400 or whatever and it'd be like what? <laughs> I, two o'clock. I still, <laughs> I still vaguely remember when I when I found out that you could change the Windows time to twenty four hours, and I gave it a try for like one night, and I was like, I'm never going back. Like oh. this is perfect. I love twenty four hour clock. It's because you can't be like, oh, let's meet at five. What five? What do you mean? What yeah. five? Like five a.m. Who's up at five a.m.? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, actually, yeah. going back to my youth, I would have been. That's one thing I have noticed. You know, I used to be able to. S Go out, stay up till five, or out till five, and then come back, do my lectures, 
and have the afternoon nap and then go out and get a do I could not do that anymore. There, There is one problem though. So uh, you've probably got it as well, where you associate numbers with other numbers. So five, free, all right? Yeah. So you're associating things. And I have accidentally purchased a train ticket for the wrong time before. <laughs> because I looked at a five and fault free and like, you know, other stuff yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. So there are a few problems <laughs> with that. But it is interesting, yeah. like how you kind of six to four, eight to six and stuff like that. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go to work. See you later. All right. Bye, Mark. Back in the office. All right. Bye. Oh, I have to recommend something because I finally got around to watching it and I love it so much. Arcane on Netflix, the League of Legends animated series. I, I, I hate League of Legends. I want to put that out there. Controversial take. Any everyone as in the game? Yeah, the game. I've never, I've never, I've heard lots about it. And being a gamer, it's a bit odd that I've never played it. But how's uh, the TV? How's the Netflix thing? Well, I will just clarify because I just said I hated it. Um, everyone I've ever watched play it, and I have played it before actually uh, with with some friends. It's it's been so toxic. It's the most toxic gaming community I've ever wow. like taken part in. I've tried dating some people that play, it, and there are definite similarities, and there's like a massive stereotype, <laughs> and I hate it so much. All right, but th with that out of the way, <laughs> um, the show is amazing. Like I, I really wasn't expecting it. Just so there's a there's a really good trailer you should watch on YouTube for it. Um, it's nine episodes, one series. I thought it wasn't going to be that good, but genuinely, it can give like Marvel stuff a run for its money. I think. Um, yeah, the animation is just crazy impressive. Like so many of like the visual effects for it. I mean, it's technically an animated style. It's hard to tell whether it's three D and two D at some parts. It's just. Amazing. I'm just having a look at the on Netflix where you get all the seasons up and the. I mean, just those thumbnails look. It is look like a, a really solid art style. It's beautiful. It's one of the best animated series I've ever seen. Wow, I'll have to check it out. Yeah, and like, I, know I know that community has been co-opted by some pretty nefarious characters yeah. over the years. So. Yeah, I I wouldn't give a League of Legends project praise if I didn't like genuinely like it. And for me to say it's one of the best animated series I've ever seen is pretty pretty high fucking praise. <laughs> So yeah, and uh, it's also because it's not just good for the animation. I think the story's good, the acting's good, the how they captured expressions. Again, I'm watching it from the technical standpoint. It, like little things, like eyes welling up for emotional moments. I'm like, is that two D or three D? I don't, I don't know how they've managed to do it. And, like, there's, there's lots of smoke and mirrors, or is there a fluid simulation going? Yeah, on? Yeah, that, there are so many moments of that when you're looking at that, you think, I don't actually know how they made that. Like, you know, and that's what that's what you want to see, you know. I like it. Wow, that is gorgeous. Look at that. It looks like it looks like like living concept art. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. It. And they do some really cool things where you know they just told them to have fun because there are some episodes where like they, they you know they they get like guest musicians to come and make mm -hmm. stuff. There's a really good soundtrack for it as well. Um but like there's some really key moments in the story where the animation style just completely changes. Gives me a bit of like a Spider-Verse vibe, I guess. But like it just goes completely mental and chaotic and just different. Like they're just experimenting with different styles for a few minutes, and then it goes back yeah. to how it was. And I'm like, wow, wow, that's like genuinely amazing. <laughs> Definitely have to check that out. I've been like, like going for a trip in the middle of a film. Yeah, exactly. I I never you, I never want to watch a series again after I finished it. But I kind of like mm -hmm. this is the first time I actually want to go back and watch it again. Like I'm like that with the Expanse. I want to go back. Oh yeah, to I've, I've the already feeling. done that with the Expanse too much. <laughs> yeah, I just I love the Expanse. I just think it's such a such a, a refreshing take on sci-fi. Although I gotta say, like, I'm watching Star Trek Discovery and I'm really liking it. So I'm in the fourth fourth season now, and I know it's like all polarizing. Whatever, I don't care about that. I like it. I never really got into Star Trek. You know, I feel like I kind of missed out on that side of things. Maybe I was a bit too young. Probably not, but. I don't know. I was really into Next Generation. Watching it back now, it's so cheesy. Um, it's cheesy, it is. And perhaps it's that's good. why I liked it's it. Cheesy. I really yeah. like Voyager. I th I thought that was. I, I don't know why. The Voyager. I loved Voyager. So the Vo Voyager was was made using the Lightwave engine, wasn't it? Yes, that was. That's, I think that was. I think it was Foundation Imaging and and um, Digital Muse. Yeah, and that's um, what got me into using 3d software yeah me too it was like i was around the time that i was like i i was watching um it was the late 90s so yeah i was watching voyager 
And, uh, and, and, and what I found, How was this I, was, done? I was in true space and I found light wave and I'm like, Hey, mm-hmm. this is what's used to create that. And I just fell in love with it. I've always wanted to work on star Trek. And the authorities come up, can come after me. For, well, 14 year old me or however old I was, it wasn't a genuine copy of light wave. I could not afford $10,000 when I was 14. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I got it for, I think but I got the it. internet I it for, was really, really great. Uh, <laughs> I picked it up on like, uh, like a, a edu- I think I got a deal somehow, and I picked it up because it was like two thousand. But I got a deal for like six hundred, and it came with hmm. uh, with um, Digital Fusion, which was a uh, DFX. It was like this light version of Digital Fusion at the time. I think I picked it up for like six or seven hundred dollars, some like crazy deal. And I was like a registered user. It was awesome, um, and uh, and it was just it was a great. Oh man, I loved I loved Light Wave. It was such a great time too because like. You know, 3D wasn't it wasn't crazy like it is today. It wasn't all over the place. It was like a pretty niche thing, mm-hmm. and uh, a niche, whatever you pronounce that. And uh, and it was just so cool because you you know the you're doing the same stuff that you're seeing on TV, um, and the rendering was slower. But Lightwave had an amazing render engine. I mean, it was mm-hmm. gorgeous. Uh, and and I, I guess like the company just kind of like, they're still around, but you know, just kind of lost a lot of users. And that was a pretty heavy. Before Blender, that was a pretty heavy fanboy infected community as well. Although it was a great, you know, the great people, um, but they were passionate about about Lightwave. And when Maya started really taking over, like it, it just uh, there was always these flame wars, you know, Lightwave artists against Maya artists. It was just it was hilarious. That's how I learned to get to stay away from any flame wars at all, because it never it's goes anywhere. Paintbrush versus paintbrush. I mean, does exactly. It really it was like. <laughs> It was hate versus hate, and I was like, "Come on, guys, just chill." But it was, it was awesome. That was a great, that was a great program. And yeah, so that was done. Uh, <coughs> Foundation Imaging and uh, Digital Muse. I think they were. Digital Muse was. Uh, I don't. I, I can't remember. I think they were the ones that were in Sunset Gower Studios, over here, um, producing for Paramount. Yeah, uh, and they just did some. I'm, but the work was phenomenal. I think they they worked partly on Voyager, and then I think they transitioned to Enterprise when it lit up. I am um, so my entryway into 3D stuff was 3D Studio Max in 2004 or five, and I think it had just gone to Autodesk. I can't quite remember. It was discreet for a long time. Y- yeah, I it might have still been discreet at that version. I think it was version seven. Um. But yeah, um, my dad got it from a friend. <laughs> uh, I, I swear there was a big conspiracy theory that that three D that uh, Discrete and Autodesk floated their own crack of it out into the world just so people adopted it. Maybe the the funny thing is it's a I don't have a photographic memory. I'm not going to say that, but I do have like a sometimes it's just I can play entire days back like a cassette tape, and then other days are just gone forever. Like it's really wow. confusing. But I remember vividly. Um, this kind of like you know the cardboard color type envelope. I don't really see them any anymore. But you know, like the the kind of brown envelopes. Manila. Is yeah. that was that what it's called? I yeah. think it's Manila. Yeah, I don't, the yellowy brown. Yeah, Manila. I, I don't see yeah. them much anymore. But yeah, there was we had like a disc in there, and there was like I think there was a couple actually, and there was a little with mess. a wink emoji on the front. Yeah, yeah. But like all the educational yeah. content back then on like these off white computers. It, actually, it wasn't off white. We had a. Uh, black dell one and anyway it was like a proper big tower pc anyway um it was all text-based no videos whatsoever mm-hmm. because of course there wasn't and it was all oh they had the teapot and they they were telling you how to make a still life scene with really bad yep. looking fruit and like yep. and these the low resolution pictures and it was really difficult to follow i remember the interface of it it was fascinating i made before some really YouTube. yeah before, yeah I, Sorry, go on. I made some really crappy spaceships out of just cubes and I, I remember the look of one and I used to drag the preset materials onto it it was like the kind of black and dark blue and it was just like slants everywhere like because I didn't know, I understand how to do any modeling properly in it and I yep. do remember when I found out about subdivision surface um, because that was still a thing back then kind of I don't know what mm. it, I don't know if it was called the same thing but there was a modifier subdivision surface yeah yeah i made um made like an insect head and i remember when i did that for the first time i was like oh, wait you don't have to place everything manually <laughs> and it was like this big whoa revelation 
That was like the yeah. day I sat down. I was in New York and I sat down with uh, I was at a photo photo expo or something. I can't remember. It was, I just got schooled schooled in light wave. William Vaughn, who's now he's uh he goes uh he's on Pixel Pixel Fondue, I think is his web is his uh YouTube channel. Right. Um and he just schooled me in subdivision surface character modeling and he was so good at it uh that it was just so inspirational. And he like sat with me for like two hours and people were like coming and watching and leaving because it was at a trade show. Mm. And I just sat there and he was just like one on one, like showed me his whole process and, and like revolutionized my stuff overnight. Literally, Amazing. I went home and like my stuff was like 90 percent better overnight. It was like incredible. But but all you had back then, you had like I think the um, Ron Thornton, the guy who who founded Foundation Imaging in valencia he had a training series um and alex alvarez was starting nomen um mm. but i think he might have still been working for autodesk at the, or working for alias at the time uh and and so th these guys were putting out some some video content and then the after effects uh so video copilot was starting up but they were all on their own sites and you yeah. actually at, at the yeah. time like it was transitioning you had to buy vhs tapes from ron thornton like DVDs weren't even available. You had to buy VHS tapes on how to model and do and do spaceships in Lightwave, and the results were pretty good. But you know, it was it was man, there was nothing like today. I yeah, you know, you you look at the the comments from these people like, why can't this be free? I'm like, do you understand? The people <laughs> who started who pioneered this stuff had nothing. Blender wasn't Blender wasn't free. There was there was no free software. If you wanted it, you had to buy in for like a thousand dollars at the very least. A thousand. Do you know? Do you not know how lucky you are? Did, yeah. Did you not know there was a time where you had to figure everything out just by yourself? <laughs> you did like like I was like I was alone in like the middle of New Jersey. No one around me knew how to do this. It, it was like I learned in a vacuum, and then yeah. I found found the community online, and then I moved up to New York City, and then I to the user groups there and meeting more people that were doing this stuff you know guys at rhinoceros studios or psyop or these other places and and then i got into xsi lightwave and then the autodesk stuff and seagraph it was like but it was a progression man i was like i was like alone in my basically like my bedroom with my computer mm. like learning yeah. this stuff you know at three o'clock in the morning now it's just like you owe us this like i have no <laughs> oh, I, I find it i find it <clears throat> amazing that now YouTube is just part of, and other services are part of our daily lives. No. And yet I, I just yeah. had to quickly look. I thought it was 2016. It was the arse end of uh this it was December 15th, 2005, YouTube was born. And I, I rewind in my mind and go back, okay, what was I doing then? Because I oh remember God. coming to YouTube incredibly late. Um, because because what I was doing at the time was nothing to do with anything online or anything along those lines. So I came to this, oh, what's this YouTube around? And that was like 2013, 2014 at the time. I was just like, looking back now, if I no. had thought about what I'm doing now back then, then it would have just been a complete game changer. It, YouTube might have been a vine at the going. time. Who'd, yep. who'd know? Which I had gone. heavy imposter syndrome at the time because at the time we were... Uh, we were all on CG talk and you mm. know, like these guys that own studios would come on and, and talk, you know, like uh, the, the guys that owned hydraulics would come on and, you know, Colin, this guy was really, 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 um, you know, really uh, heavy uh, participant and uh, would just share all, all this knowledge and stuff. And, uh, and I just felt so small because, you know, here I am in like at the time, like in 2001, 2002, like in New Jersey. And, you know, he's just, here's like these people in Hollywood that are coming in and, you know, they're working on movies and I'm like super imposter syndrome. And, uh, but I remember I got my master's, I did my master's thesis as a recorded video, as a tutorial video. That was my thesis for, for education because I have a, a master's degree in education. And nice. I, that's how I did it. And it was December of 2005. And that's when YouTube mm. launched shortly after. And I didn't put two and two together because I was hyper focused on, you know, yep. getting into, into the industry, not, you know, or work out actually at the time I was working in the industry while I was teaching at the time um, and doing freelance. So I was actually working, but I didn't put two and two together. And had it started, I'd, you know, been lucky enough to become, you know, I'd be the guru right now. And whatever but you, you can't look you can't you can't look you, at your life like that you, you, no, you, no. you, you know. could have been the donut guy i could have been the donut Hi, guy but, I, but I, I wasn't had a weird existential moment I, while you're talking 
uh, a minute ago, thinking back about, like, again, touching 3D for the first time and realizing it was nearly 20 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is weird, because yeah, I'm 26 right, right. now. And you were, like, I, six years old. I remember it. I remember what I was doing. I remember trying to show my friends at the time. I remember what else was happening. Like, it's, it's, uh, it feels weird. I vividly remember trying to make um, the wing of an AC Cobra using well, hmm. SolidWorks. I that's think that's that, the. Yeah. I think that's the basic version of uh, Pro Engineer, if I remember correctly. But our school, our tech department, had SolidWorks, and I, I was trying to poly model without the knowledge of a subdivision service modifier which or NURBS, which would have been far easier, yeah. <laughs> this this wing. And I, I remember going backwards and forwards with it and making a wheel and all the rest of it. And I remember that very, very vividly. But of course, there's no way that I've th that was on my school server, so I never had a copy of that yeah. or anything. So it's really sad that I can't reach and grab that as an example of this is how I started 3D, um, which is a real, a real shame. But I can't. I can't go back to those times. Yeah, you know, I, I have to dig through hard drives and and probably CDs that are twenty years old that don't even work anymore. CD ROMs that are probably like so yeah, their life data off them anymore. I was gonna do like a, a video if I hit a hundred thousand um, to do a like here's where I started, you know, and 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 here's where I am, and what am I twelve thousand away from it now or something, eleven thousand away. So that's cruising up there, but yeah, you, can always, you can always you can always kind of fake it give an example of what it was like and just say yeah. artist representation underneath like nasa does with the exoplanets exactly <laughs> it's always exactly. disappointing oh it's a rip oh, okay yeah yeah <laughs> you just need to zoom yeah. in a little hubble just zoom in uh james <laughs> webb come to our rescue yeah i know i'm I know. so excited about that i'm like first photo when it came out and it was like here's a photo of a really bright star misaligned i'm like yeah that's, that's so cool <laughs> but it's working and that's that's yes you know i the, there was a lot of blood sweat and tears on that on that program and uh it's it's really nice to see it working can't believe it didn't go wrong like for you know the launch and all of that i mean i mean i can't believe it, yeah. it happened i'm, I'm happy yeah. it went right but it's like you know um after all that time it worked well the company that built it knows what they're doing so yeah uh, yeah they're very good it's 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 amazing how something so complex i mean often you try and make things as simple as possible so there's no points of failure or as few as possible and i don't know what uh the james Webb space telescope had like 500 points of failure or something it's like any one of these hundred things goes wrong we're screwed yeah yeah it, it was a lot <laughs> oh oh it another, a lot. another thing going back a bit as well this pub tub we were talking about the early software i remember the first programming language i actually got my hands on and it wasn't html which i think i might have actually told people before and that's not even a program it's a markup language technically but like that's like you know the entryway it was dark basic i don't wow. know if anyone had heard of that yes it was a, it was an original engine um well i mean it was a language but there was an engine dark basic that you could use to create games with it was yeah. it was mm -hmm. It worked. I, mean, I, I played with that a lot, and it's because they had a few different products. They had Dog Basic, Dog Basic Pro, and then they had some other things as well to like kind of make it more accessible to make games. And it was weird because mm -hmm. it had this weird interface. I don't know if you remember or if you ever saw it. It was like no, to code no. Dog Basic, it had its custom program, and it was a blue background, and it had like these kind of funky graphics going up the side, and I think it was like yellow text or something, or like a yellow whatever they call the indicator. I can't exactly remember. But I remember the logo was like a pyramid with an eye on it. And yep. yeah, I remember playing with that. And like, th there was. The Illuminati. <laughs> yeah, there was tutorials. I didn't understand a thing, but like, I would copy yeah. the text down. And there was like an infinite runner cave tutorial you could do. And that was fun because you type all it in, in and then it would work. Sometimes it didn't. But if it did, you could play it. And that was really cool. And I never made anything myself because I didn't understand a thing about it. <laughs> but that was like the first hands on. And yeah, um, yeah, I remember that. Uh, you mentioned was, HTML there. When I was making that um, AC Cobra wing, mm. I don't know mm -hmm. why I didn't make the entire car, but my, my friend Darren was doing HTML and I had a look and went, like, oh, that looks a bit boring. <laughs> so <Some laughs> applications of the web. <laughs> I know. I found HTML in the computer lab one day. While I was hanging out and, and just using the internet because it was so mm. new. It was like 1996. And there were, uh, there were the, the computer science guys that were in there. 
and uh, they showed me how to create you know my first lines of html and so i started making a website it was hilarious i remember like i had a voyager gif as as part of the website it was like it was like it was i basically yeah. created that thing that that you know homer simpson had when he created his first website it was like every oh. animated gif available on the same page at the same time <laughs> that was my first site it's awesome uh, isn't there a site out there now the worst website ever oh that was it probably yeah that, yep. that's the logo for dark basic oh yeah yeah yep it says the ultimate 3D games creator. Obviously, this is well before a time when game engines were like accessible properly. They, I think the, was... the the Torque game engine wasn't too long afterwards. I think. Yeah, Torque was great because it was uh, they 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 did tribes that game tribes yeah. on Torque, and I had it. It was great. I had well, okay. I had the engine, and I actually was was creating stuff in it. Not usable, but I was creating stuff. Yeah, and uh, my brother and I, my brother and I found Unity. Actually, it was a guy out here, um, who uh, who turned me on to Unity. He was he was in the Lightwave user group. He was I think he was working at Zoic at the time, um, and he, he he mentioned it. And I was, I went home and I was like, oh, this is the coolest thing ever. And I told my brother, and immediately we bought MacBook MacBook Pros <laughs> because it would only run version one of Unity would only oh. run on, on Apple. So we bought MacBook mm -hmm. Pros and we got the we got Unity and we started creating. We created a, a company. Right oh, then wow. and there, that's and, awesome. uh, we ran it. We ran it for a few years, and then, uh, and then we didn't live in New Jersey anymore. And New Jersey closed our charter because our accountant didn't submit something. <laughs> Oops. So, <laughs> we're just like, well, at the time though, we were just like, we were both focused on other stuff, so we weren't doing much of the company anymore. But uh, yeah. yeah, we had a good run. We had a good run. That's really cool. I we created stuff. We marketed. We got it out there. It was fun. I I like talk because I thinking about it i've been playing with this stuff longer than i thought i had done um mm. i played with talk before unity was a thing like i've got books for talk they, they were big freaking books i don't know who wrote them right but they're like really chunky stuff and i remember there was a tutorial with some kind of orc and a crossbow in talk yeah. and like i remember yeah. playing with that quite a lot and yeah so it's just funny because it's like bringing back memories um, yeah it was a nice thing yeah, it was pretty cool. It had like a proper Unity. 3D viewer. It yeah. did. It didn't have, it was a more code based. It wasn't as, you know, like when Unity came around, it was just like, it was, it was amazing because it, it was, because you had, there was the, the Unreal Editor existed. Mm. Um, and, uh, but it wasn't, uh, you, like you could get it with the, like the game Unreal. You could get it and you could use it to, you know, people were using it to mod stuff with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember but, uh, those. I remember yeah, playing were... with the Half Life engine modifier, mm -hmm. um, and and actually mm. playing with that, and then looking at what you can achieve in today's three D software. It's it's so much more accessible than it's ever been. Yeah, it I, really. Is. With Source, there was Hammer, which was like the the tool you would use to make the maps. I think. Yeah. Hammer and yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember make... playing around with maps, and um, a fr a friend of mine at school was producing loads of counter-strike maps mm -hmm. his, his map was dust the original dust <gasps> wow i oh, can't God. remember the figure he got paid but he got paid a, for, for for a youngster like 16 17 he got paid an awful lot of money for that map yeah it's... good i was like wow i'm not worthy by it's not worth doing <laughs> i know it, it was a it was a crazy time it really mm. was. I mean, I, I was I was in it, knee deep in it. I, was, I think I was too deep in it because I didn't see the, the the possibilities at the time for you know when Notch created Minecraft and I mean all this stuff was just like, uh, yeah, I, know, it's, being, it's really weird. There. I shunned Minecraft for the, its first ten years. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and then it, I, looked all, it looked pixelated. I was like, what's this? I was crap? like, oh, that's I no didn't realize how awesome it was until I played it. I have to be <laughs> careful. It's so addictive. Yeah, it is addictive. It's one of my favorite games now. I love it. Yeah, I, I, go, I go and I, I was in there yesterday with my with my son. We were playing it, and you know, yeah. survive the first night. It's the best part of the yeah, whole game. Yeah, definitely. You know, survive the <laughs> first night. Find sheep. Get bed. Cut wood. You know, it's like <laughs> running around with a wooden axe. Where's the sheep? Exactly. Where's the sheep? If the, if I don't get this sheep, I'm gonna have to live in a cave for the next twenty minutes of gameplay. <laughs> or dig down to three three holes and put one block above you. Exactly, one above and, and, and see. And then wait 10 yeah, minutes. Wait. 
and wait and wait. Is it light out yet? Is it light out yet? Yeah. Hey, Siri, set a timer for 10 minutes. There we go. Oh, oops. I am. Um, I've, I've, I've brought down my diary because I, <laughs> I remembered I had the only surviving piece of artwork from my 3D Studio Max days printed up and I've shown it somewhere before and it was just a render Ooh. test. Yeah. It was just spheres. Nice. Just it was yeah. like one of the earliest things, a spheres with different of the preset materials. That's just an NFT. Be honest with us. It's a printed. I was doing NFT. NFTs before they were cool, and you, you could see the faint remnants of where blue tack was, right on this. Wow. There's no blue yeah. tack remaining. It's just like it's remnants yeah. because for years it was posted on um at like a workbench in my room, like when it was a completely different layout. So this was just like sitting like on there. And it's the only surviving nice. one, I think, because I used to have like just regular printer paper printouts of like different renders I had did. So I look after this one because it's the only awesome. one left. Yeah, I remember my first, I think the first 3D I ever did was in Pav Ray, Persistence of Vision Ray Tracer. It was, uh, it was command line based and I was like, ooh, this is really cool. And like I was at the time could have bought an Amiga um, and I missed that boat too. So I'm like, Wow, like a lifetime of missed opportunities. I, I seem to recall, because I had an Amiga 500 with the add-in board that was literally this big for 512 yeah. kilobytes. Uh-huh. <laughs> so a whole meg of RAM. But I remember playing, so Deluxe Paint 2, I did so many drawings and I printed them out on a dot matrix printer. It was amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> with it, with it. <laughs> yeah. but I swear I played with a couple of 3D programs, but I didn't know what they were. Yeah, I had no mm. concept. I, I <clears throat> might have been got a few discs, um, popped them in, and it was just like, oh, what's this? Oh, it's kind of cool. You know, a 3D ball or something or a triangle. Because 3D back then was so so rudimentary. It was just, I mean, there might have been 16 polygons in an entire scene, sort of thing. Yeah. Mm. At the time of the Amigas, it was, I mean, it was just starting in the late 80s, was just starting to become viable. You know, Industrial Light and Magic were out there with the Pixar system, and they, 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 they were making it happen, but they had tons of money and cash behind them, and they would, you know, and, and geniuses uh, working there. But the Amiga was great because you could do it at home, and Lightwave started there with the video toaster, New Tech, and mm -hmm. um, I think uh, a few other things started there too. And then Silicon Graphics, you know, rose up and, and you know, Power Animator and, uh, and Prisms. And then they became Maya and Houdini. And 3D Studio Max was running on, you know, on, on, on uh, Windows NT. It was only running on NT. No, oh, that yeah, was, was crazy. You know, you guys keep talking for a minute. I'm just going to see... I probably won't find it, but I think the old like talk books are somewhere down there. So I'm just gonna have a little, have a little look. Nice. So yeah. Oh, I'm about to sneeze as well. Excuse me. Gazuntai. Gazuntai. Ah, merci. Uh, so, <laughs> so I, I'm amazed looking back at how much I touched upon when I was completely clueless as to. Uh, yeah. As to any of this so with the amiga as well the 500 was one of the ones that had um i'm not sure whether it plugged into the serial or parallel port but it had like audio where like the origins of tracker software tracker yeah the, and i the, remember yeah. playing with tracker software as well and not really mm -hmm. I, I made some little bleep bloop tunes yeah and it, it's it's amazing how i've touched on all of this stuff over my lifetime but not realized how much of an impact it's probably had on my life and guide, guided me in yeah. in what I'm doing today. It's fantastic. I know. It's like, I mean, it's like playing with Legos when you're a kid and you don't realize like Legos transitions right into 3D. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's often... I mean, I often say to, when you start off, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's it. I remember. Yeah, so there's a bunch wow, of stuff in here. Wow, CD-ROM back too. Yeah. <laughs> what's, what's the cover of that one? Uh, I, I, oh. This one is actually, I think it's the modernized. Um, actually. Oh yeah. Because I think there was old ones, and they reprinted them with this kind of like interesting Mr. style. Thompson. Yeah. So there's like old pictures of the editor in there. Yep. So that's it, but that's how you learned 3D back then. You grabbed yeah. one of those books, and you and went cried. through it. 
you cried and, yeah, cried. and cried. I've got and a dog, dog basic pro one back there as well. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Archero. Hey, Archero. Boys, 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 boys. Boys, 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 boys. <laughs> What's up? boys, boys. How's it going? I'm popping oh, in to say hello. I haven't been on in a minute. It's Ellie's grandmother's 80th birthday, so I got to happy dip birthday. Back Congratulations. Out. But happy birthday. Yeah, you don't turn 80 every day. But just no, popping in, no. say hello to familiar faces, wish you well. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll be able to jump in a little bit later. Awesome. Alrighty. Nice. Well, thanks for popping along. We've just been yeah, reminiscing about all kinds of stuff. Uh, uh, yeah, the past. Was... Yes. I, I've, been, I've been playing around with some GPT-3... Uh, just generative art today and it's oh, it's been so amazing to go and and kind of reference some different photographers that i like and then feed this program some prompts and see what it spits out i'm really excited to share it with you all oh that's um, cool uh, wow. oh man it's, it's been crazy that sounds fun what is gpt g what is this one is second general purpose training it's like the it's like the ai that can't be released to the public because it's too powerful Oh, that okay. Now, I I played with I I think I posted it here a few a few months back about. It, oh, that like, okay. It's like an auto generate. Uh, this is just like a, a very small subset of it where you start yeah. a sentence and it can write paragraphs and paragraphs for you. I, mm -hmm. I did it with some three D modeling stuff as if I was writing a script, and it came up with quite a compelling script. I mean, it would need curation afterwards. Yeah. But after a few clicks, I was like, okay, that's that's potentially a video idea done. With, Whoa, that's really with, cool. With very little effort. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's been it's been a great fun to play with and I'm trying to figure out and work out how to run it on my own machine instead of using the notebooks and such. But look I, I just posted in the voice chat a prompt yeah, that I gave it. That. Isn't that so clean and so beautiful? It is. That's AI? Yep. Now nah, we're done. We're all finished. We're done. We're done. Yeah, we're fired. Oh, that's image yeah. creation. Yep. Yep. Okay. Concept art out there. Oh, window. nice. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> oh, none, yeah. of the, none of the viewers can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Concept art is done. It's like it's like a kind of sci-fi room type thing. There you go. I mean, that's like the bridge of the Enterprise if it had a fridge in the back. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it looks like the bridge of the Enterprise. I mean, it's got that aesthetic. So look, this is dark the dark basic, basic. pro one. And um, <laughs> interesting thing to note here is all you people with low attention spans for learning code, about halfway through the book, you're making squares and circles. Okay? Yeah. So you have to get that far just to do that. And then it starts talking about bitmap sprites. So not even Ouch. getting onto 3D type stuff. So it was hard in the olden days. <laughs> yeah. Half the book to, I mean, you'd be writing the code to, you'd be writing the shader code basically to get yeah. the to get the pixels yep. on the screen, which you don't have to do these days unless you are um, Gabe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you're Gabe, then yes, then you do that. A master intellect. I've, yeah. if, if my brain... I, I, I loved it. He was showing the recent stuff that you can use geometry nodes to do some ray casting and do a global illuminated scene. I was like, cool, if only I had like half the brain cell to understand one third of a tenth of what how that's put together and then they explained yeah. it it was like see above <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly Gabe, Gabe, is, Gabe's, Gabe is brilliant and uh, he's just doing some amazing stuff he's gonna write his own engine yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I, I, it's I think it's more part of the young like... mind he's got into it really young and so it's just like it's just like their world it's fantastic yep I think it's, is. it's also I think the the lack of a fear of that intelligence barrier. Yeah. I think it might be easier for young people not to <laughs> not to have it. It's not a fear. I want to know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like it. uh, it's, true. it's a real barrier. Yeah. yeah. It, it's amazing that sort of thing. I've been looking for a way in for years, uh, but for a way in that I can teach to people who also want a way in. I'm looking at it from that perspective, and I I I firmly believe you don't have to learn all of the maths up until that point to understand it. Yeah, Obviously, you do know you do need to understand some maths. You can't just go, oh, I'll do it without maths. That, that's not what I'm saying. But the the fact that if obviously you've got the background in knowing fundamental maths and knowing it incredibly well, that sort of stuff, you start reading, you're like, 
oh yeah, and you continue. A lot of the material out there assumes like three or four years worth of math intellect going in here and sticking in here. And, yep. you know, unfortunately for me, that was that was 20 years ago. Yeah, I'm like, here. I'm like, I kind of get it. I, I can read some of the stuff and I understand what's happening. And I'm like, but how, but how, but how? And I, I just can't find that that link and i'm like i really i mean this is laziness at this point i know i really don't want to learn uh for the next two years so i can do this one thing that i think might be yeah. cool exactly it's like so. it's, it's like at what point is there you know the, the law of diminishing returns mm. kicks in and you're like i i i mean there's all this cool stuff but like what do i want to chase and then when yeah. you when yeah. you get when you get in your 40s you're just like all right i you know what? Not there like, yet. Not I, at some point, I'm going to have to retire. It's still 20, 20 some odd years, 27 years away or what? 20 years away from yeah. here. But I'm like, I can't, you know, it goes fast. And you're like, all right, well, I just got to do whatever I can to fill that bank account so I don't die when I'm, you know, I'm not destitute. Yeah, real life and all that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, well, I've, I, I've, I've sort of sought out some of the, some of the need to learn some stuff through coding. You know, now I'm I qu quite far into Python, especially with its integration to Blender. Like oh. that, I never thought I'd be able to like do those things. I bang my head with the Blender yeah. API. Yeah, you've been, you've update. been bumping into the. Okay, so that update issue isn't something that people just scratching the surface usually bump into because that that's actually yeah. quite a, a issue runs deep and <laughs> and that um that actual problem you bumped into about stuff not updating with geometry nodes i think that's something that they actually need to address it's a little bit of a bug because other yeah. parts of blender when you run code like that it, it, it updates fine but i think there are some i think it's something to do with the dependency graph when some values in the geometry nodes they don't update along with other parts of the interface so it's there's like yeah. a mismatch so yeah, it's interesting. You've actually bumped in, bumped into that because I bumped into that like a few weeks ago as well, and it yeah. really confused me. <laughs> I was just like, "But I'm doing everything the documentation." And it, there's even a bit in the documentation where they say you shouldn't do this, and then you scroll down. It's oh, you really shouldn't do this, and you scroll down, and, you're like, ah, and it's it's phrased like that in the documentation. So, ah, okay, if you really want to do this, we do not recommend it. It's not a bug. If you report it as a bug, we'll ignore you. Do this. Yeah. So I did that, and it's so like. Now, in the end, I ended up solving mine in a similar way to you. Um, my solution was go into edit mode in the code, come out of edit mode in the code. Not only does the uh, viewport update, but also the value updates as well. Yeah, I exactly. Like, <clears throat> I was like, I could have done this hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> it was so frustrating. Uh, but yeah, geometry knows it leads nicely into that because geometry knows is a visual way of coding. So it's a great way of a visually representing representating good word Mike. Repres we'll stick with yeah. it. <laughs> representing um uh, how things interact in the 3d world normals vectors and all that like it's really it's a really great way of getting into maths in a visual way rather than yeah. necessarily understanding it on a mathematical uh, basis so but it's just a different way because geometry yeah. has always been a way you could pick up maths <laughs> i thought you know i've been amazed at some geographical solutions to problems that otherwise i've been given Lot, like the long mathematical way of solving <clears throat> and geometry actually you can solve it incredibly quickly so it's just true. a different way of thinking about it the, the, there are two things i want to say first of all exactly what you said there Aaron messaged me recently trying to ask about you know interesting ways to kind of teach yourself code coding i said don't learn it in isolation that's what mm -hmm. most people do when they think oh, i want to learn code they go to a website that's been designed to teach them code and then they drop it like after a, a you need you need a thing days. you need yeah. to do a thing yeah, do, yeah, yeah. so do. Blender is our thing, and it's a really yeah. good kind of lens to do it around. And for other languages like C Sharp for Unity, Unity was the thing. You know, you're yeah. making stuff interact, that's that's fine. Um, but I actually did, like, okay, so I said this to some friends. If I didn't get into code in school, I would have never gotten into it because I'm much more of an artsy person anyway. The only reason mm -hmm. I'm good at it, like... You know, a, well, it's subjective depending on kind of you know what stuff you want to do. Yeah. Um, is because I got into it fairly early in school, and it was more of an outlet for like a very emotional time. Um, I found that when I'm having an extremely emotional time in my life, or there's like a lot of pressure or something, and I need an outlet, that's when I learn the most, the fastest. And it's because yeah. like it's almost like you're kind of screaming at the universe, and you need something, and that's like your way out. Gives um, you a deep focus. Yeah, kind of like that. And so at that point in my life in school, I wasn't doing well. This is 
I, I, I've always said that learning to code triggered like the intellect, like in my mind to actually wake up and all Probably of a sudden did. I started doing well. Yeah. So there was a point when I was extremely frustrated. I was not doing well in any classes. I was being bullied a bit. And at this like psycho psychology time, this ties into a fear of me being, I have a fear of being framed for something I haven't done because it's happened a lot like throughout school. Um, so it'd even be stupid stuff like someone would print off my work in IT like a hundred times and I'd always get told off for it. Like, are you sure you didn't just type in 100? I'm like, no, I know exactly who did it. Like, you know, it's it was really annoying. So all that stuff was really getting to me. Also emotion, uh, emotion wise, kind of waking up to uh, my sexuality haven't spoken mm -hmm. about that on blender nest before um but that that really piled stuff on and it was like this whole oh god like it's like a switch moment and then everything clicked and code coding was my outlet because it was a way to have something to know that no one else knew so no longer would i feel like i'm absolutely stupid i now know something that no one else does and that's that was like that was my thing so i held on to it really strongly so because yeah. of that that was like that's the reason why I've continued with coding from onwards, but there have been other points in life related to that as well. 2018 was a rough time and I kind of, I dived right into network coding and like cloud systems and stuff. And that's now sitting there in the back of my head and I'm never going to use it again, probably, but it's there. And I'm like, wow, okay, that's kind of interesting. I now know exactly where to go to do those kinds of projects. But the one, go ahead. I was going to say the one thing that I uh, latch on and I completely agree with you there is is the coding side it's, it's almost like it's a um it's always a challenge and you can very easily get a quick result from it as well if mm. you bite-sized chunk it i've always loved coding with a purpose so yeah. like you were go, going about earlier doing it in isolation makes no sense whatsoever but using something like blender i mean even something like gimp that and a lot of programs have basic interfaces that either use Python or Lua as another uh, yeah. one that often interacts with programs at a pretty fundamental level. You're essentially just controlling the interface or just below the interface with code. And Blender makes it incredibly easy these days to do some of the basic operations. Uh, you fall flat if you try and get too advanced too quickly because you suddenly realize, actually, I need to know another layer of coding to get something working. But I love that challenge and then getting a result. And I can dive in. I've got to be careful. If I end up going into that, I can end up hyper-focused for most of the week. Like yeah. I, I was recently trying to export a character. And so, okay, I've exported the character, but the skeleton hasn't come across. Okay, let's get the skeleton. Across. Great. The animations. Oh, crap. They're all in the NLA editor. How do I export each one of these individually? And then four days went past, but at the end it was like, tick, I'm yep. exporting it. And that, I mean, it's a selfish reason for doing it, but I think that's a good entry point into coding. It's got to be something that you really want to achieve. For me, it was exporting 50 animations is going to take 50 hours because it's going to take, well, no, not 50 hours, but it's going to, you know, you export one that's a minute on you export the next so it's an, at least an hour so if i've got to do this every time i've got to export an animation why can't i automate it and ultimately yeah. once you've got that code working suddenly you don't have to spend minutes or hours doing something you click a button done and that can really make the difference if you're if you're pumping out game assets for a game and you want them to be in fbx or gltf or whatever um, particular format you want with certain parameters with everything in the right place uh, but you want your scene to be spread out with all your models showing them off and then on export you want them all at the origin but when you don't want to move them all there and then move them all back manually well that can be done in code and it's a click of a button and like seven seconds later you've exported 50 objects it's it's a godsend yeah, absolutely and you know there's actually there's something quite satisfying about figuring out a solution to a problem you know and like beca because code has to be yeah. perfect i mean it can it can be inefficient there can be multiple ways to do it but it has to be perfect oh, yeah. to work it's like once you've got it it's right there it's like a delicately crafted thing and you're like okay i can copy that and use that whenever the problem happens again yeah i i created a, a, a so i was using mixamo animation so i was importing a load of animations and, and exporting them and i managed to make this plugin it works brilliant adobe released one the other day <coughs> uh, 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 uh like three days later i was like oh no have i just wasted my but actually they complement each other really well mm. that one does like your one export this one does lots of exports so i was like phew they complement one another and i i got into this position where i was just like 
do I do I kind of wrap this up in a nice little package or do I give people the raw code? And then one of one of my students came along and said, "I've is it okay if I, you know, can I please?" Uh, and I was like, "What is it? Can I can I, can I release my version of it?" I was like, "Well, well what if you change it?" So she was like, "Well, now it works on Mac, it works on Linux." It works. I was just like, <laughs> Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you've improved it. That's brilliant. Thank you. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> love it. I think one that... of the lovely, lovely things about code. I'm back. I'm on an ice run, uh, somewhat self-imposed, just so I could, you know, hang out with y'all for a bit because it's been a minute. But in listening to that, it's uh, it's one of the beauties of code when you get to kind of watch it grow or morph. Uh, yeah. Thanks to the community, and obviously that's one of the many many reasons why we love blender and the add-ons and such yeah it, it, what you were saying mike takes me back to uh my previous job we did a lot of ordering pizza for big events so i'd end up having to order you know about 25 pies of pepperoni 25 pies of this 25 wow. and it always changed depending on how many people were coming to the event and I figured I'm always doing this math, like, you know, a couple of days before, why, why don't I just automate it? So I wrote a Python script to help me just use the math that I was using already and condense it all down to a, some command line entries where I would just enter, you know, pizza.py for Python, pizza pie. And then it would ask me the questions that I needed to know, like how many people are attending? Are there any food allergies? What kind of pizza do you want? How many slices per person are we expecting? And, uh, you know, once I did that, then I was able to not be the pizza person anymore. I was able to just pass it on to somebody. And since it was kind of properly documented, somebody else could be the pizza pie orderer. And uh, that's also one of the beauties of it, just being able to pass down packages and, like you said, watch them grow, watch people kind of adapt and, and change them and adopt them. I love it. Yeah, for us, that's fantastic. I've, I've heard some stories. I think I saw it on Reddit where someone... Um spoke about how they kind of cheated their work for like i don't know if it was a matter of years where they were just doing basic tasks and they they hired someone else elsewhere in the world to to write a program for them to do it for them and then they just left it running and they just like stayed there and watched films for <laughs> forever because like no one checked on them and i think okay well and props to them like because i can't say that i wouldn't be a bit sneaky and do something like that if i was in a similar position but that's kind of like the beauty of code for like automation and like, you know, improving workflows, making the world a better place. <laughs> oh, I've God. heard yeah. similar things where I th you, you might have remembered it, it. I think it was about 18 months ago. There was this chap who was actually had five subcontracts right. and or, or five or six, something along those lines. And he then subcontracted all the work. So I think he was in the States. So he was subcontracting each job out at like 50K or something, but taking in 80K for each one. <laughs> And I looked at it and went, no company can possibly be angry with this because this is exactly why they hire staff. <laughs> it's 100% yeah. that. Um, obviously, there might have been problems with outsourcing confidential information and the rest of it. But kudos to the guy being able to do, you know, leverage him, himself that far. Absolutely. And if anybody's listening and curious about it, there is this series called, literally called Automate the Boring Stuff, uh, mm -hmm. which is somewhat of an entry into Python if you are curious about how you can do something like, um, you know, we, earlier Mike was talking about exporting mm -hmm. stuff, but even if it, even something as simple but as time consuming as renaming files, batch renaming files, like these are the sort of things that are a task that you might be doing all the time uh -huh. that yeah. if you spend the four hours or so it might take to wrap your brain around how to do it programmatically, you'll save yourself so much time in the long run just, just by doing that favor to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's true. I've, I've got the, there's a Python book in the similar si series about automating the boring stuff. I will throw a, a, a big warning in there. If you're going to do something on a programmatic level, and you will do this at some point, I'm going to tell you not to, but um, <laughs> just remember, if you're batch doing something, if you make a mistake, you're going to batch mistake a lot. Mm -hmm. So test it on non-crucial data, things like <clears throat> renaming or changing a file extension or whatever it happens to be. A, a classic example is like simple things like capitalizing 
each beginning word. So you've got, I think that's called a capital case. I don't know what the actual case is called or camel case or whatever. Camel but case. Yeah. If you need something capitalized in a certain way, and you can just run a script to do that. But you can also make a real pig's ear of your file system if you get something wrong because you tend to give your code that you're running, oh yeah, admin permissions. Off you go, go ruin my computer. Yeah. And you can seriously you can seriously do a lot of damage very quickly once you've scripted something. I accidentally so. deleted an entire web server <laughs> um, by using the wrong recursive tag. Ask. Yeah, Oops. yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. You, and, you think, oh yeah, I've got it. There was no backup. I mean, I could I could have had a snap. It was this was on a Google Cloud like a compute service, and I should have had a snapshot for it, but I didn't. And like it, it took ages to set it up as well because it had all the SSL security certificates on mm. the thing, and it, there was a whole wiki on there, and it's just gone in a, in a keystroke. Oh. That's a lot of ice. Is that for the cocktails? Oh, yeah. Nope, no alcohol, just just fancy fizzy drinks. Um, That's what I call my cocktails too. Yeah, is a third. Yeah, Curtis, that reminds me of um, the. Toy Story 2 debacle story. I don't know if y'all have heard of that. Um, but apparently Toy Story... And I, I might be misremembering, so as always, do your own research. But Toy Story 2 was actually accidentally deleted. Um, and, you know, it got to the point where they were like, oh, holy smokes, we're going to have to remake this movie. Um, but it turns out that one of the producers or artists on the film was on maternity leave at the time and she had a backup on her home computer so she yeah. saved toy story 2 and she's now one of the producers on the lightyear film if i remember correctly so that's nice. kind of a cool nice. kind of club story and also a testament to how volatile and and kind of dangerous and and uh um, what's the word i'm looking for here uh, vulnerable there you go yeah um your file system is and just like mike was warning you got you got to be really careful always do like a test folder and maybe even two three test folders and if you get yeah. really into the weeds of it run your stuff on a virtual machine because you can do sandbox. a lot of damage yeah exactly work in a da sandbox environment before you take anything out uh, and make it operational because uh, you might end up uh, wiping all of toy story 5. yeah oh god there's a really bad moment when like the realization of your problem dawns on you because again yeah. going back to that web server problem i did have some snapshots but i didn't have one that had like all the data i needed on it and i remember just looking through repeatedly again and again like all of like where the backup files are and just being like oh no i genuinely can't get it back like this is physically impossible to get this back <laughs> i'd be like oh no <laughs> I hate I, so I've made much. mistakes in the past that uh, propagate into hours of work trying to figure something that should be basic out. And it could be simple, like uh, I, I mistyped something. I uh, I typed style in with the T and the Y the wrong way around. Mm. And, and you know how the human brain is a phenomenal thing where if you read something and the letters are rearranged, either side of the two end letters, you'll still be able to read it. Yeah. Yeah, that's not a great thing when you need to get something completely accurate. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely personal experience. <laughs> oh, going back yeah. to code again, like the number of times I spent hours trying to fix a solution for single character typos. And it'll be mm -hmm. it will be something stupid like there are two variables with similar names and you're just using the wrong one and that's why it all goes to part. Yeah. But oh, wow. yeah. I you often to... end up with very, you, you, you know, that old adage, you, should, you, sh you shouldn't have to comment your code. It should be human readable. You should just be able to read it and it makes sense as to what it's doing. Yeah, that's not great when you're like, well, I'm really going to go. This variable is called the variable that does the thing that makes sure that the other variables <laughs> just ends up with yeah. a big blog. <laughs> no. I do not. Con I, I, <laughs> I do not condone the lack of commenting your code because from personal experience you don't do it and you're like oh, I'll remember exactly what I meant you go back to it six months later you are like who was I back then and why did I do this to myself <laughs> yep. it, it doesn't take it doesn't take six months it can take six days six hours you know you wake up the next morning you're like what was I doing do you know because you've slept and you were sleep deprived when you the, <laughs> wrote the thing down one thing I've noticed is that the way I comment code has changed over the years even recently as well, um, when doing the 9.1 update for Bygen, I was like, 
huh, actually, let me do a little test. And like adding extra line spaces, like after comments and stuff, and you know, just just testing and like for my own readability and going, actually, I prefer doing it this way. And it's not even necessarily how other people write it, because I know there are definite conventions and they have names, mm. you know, what programmers are like. They've got like specific version names for ways to write code, you know, <laughs> like it's very, yeah. uh, but uh, no, I just like, I've, I've been adjusting the way that I like reading it and it's kind of gone a lot clearer now, but it's, it's mostly down to like a good use of space, even simple yeah, things you- like once in Python using the hashtag for making a comment different from like two forward slashes and like C yeah. languages, just leaving one space after the, the comment like indicator makes a big difference for readability. Yeah. And like also just leaving a line sometimes like in between scopes. So like yeah. it's spacing things out using your white space because it costs nothing to yeah. go through white space once it's compiled. So it's yeah, I, I, I tend to almost like a chapter and title. Sometimes I don't comment on the side of things. I comment above Yeah, and then do the thing underneath and then comment above because no, there's nothing worse than being on like your laptop and you were on your computer with, uh, let's say you're on an ultra wide screen. So you can see the comments for miles. Then you go do some work on your laptop and because it's a 13 inch screen, you're like, I'm going to have to scroll sideways on every single one of these things. Yeah. One, one thing I do is um, for loops, for, for loops, for no, loops. yeah. <laughs> hey, um, for, for it's not always for loops, for, but for for loops and other loops, um, I'll I'll put like a li- a comment line above it, which says which is the plain English version of the loop. So yeah. so I will write for every collection that has this, you know, mm. and I'll like I'll write that above the for loop, so I can just read that. I don't need to decipher the loop code yeah. myself. I can just go, oh, this is where that stuff happens, and then just keep yeah. looking down there. So you're kind of like stepping through it instructionally like a recipe, so it's easier to find the right place. I like doing that. That's useful. Yeah. I, I, think, I think conventions and things like that really help when you're working in a team. When you've got two or more people working on a code base, you need to have the same syntax essentially you you can't do one thing for one code base and one for another they need to be uh, the same i think when you're working for yourself uh the rules can just go out the window but yeah. then it can get inconsistent as you were saying you, you you change how you write code because often the things you're writing get more complex they're they're at the same level to you but you've you've grown in your experience with coding so you're able to write more complex code and understand more complex code you, you adjust your your comments to cater for it yeah but then you have the problem when you go back in time with your own code base you start to question who's written this this is me from the past me from the past is stupid yeah yeah, yeah. I, I used to me from the past sucks <laughs> yeah i am um, i used to do a thing where i to, to make it obvious where i would have as you say kind of like chapters in your code I'd have like a long line of of like a character just to make it really obvious when scrolling down. Okay, well, this is like a chapter and like, you know, separating it like that. Spam the hash key. Yeah, exactly. I would do that. And that that worked fine for a while. But now I use like region folding a lot in VS Code, which is where you can define regions and collapse them, control K zero. And like, I I love it so much because you can have like a long code file, which turns into four lines and just expand as you need it amazing ever since i've started doing that i don't use those long lines anymore because i'm like okay these folds i've made they are my chapters and i'm expanding it like a book and yeah. um that's really helpful I, I will say as well i need to close this up in a second because it's been yeah, one hour yeah, 40. oh wow yeah so look at us old ladies nattering away yes yeah. <laughs> so is there anything else anyone wants to say before we close it up thanks bye yeah, subscribe. thank you. Yes, yeah, subscribe. <laughs> subscribe. <laughs>